I will start initially talking about what is universal health coverage because uh, you need to understand that concept first. In the larger domain of the sustainable development goals, you, I'm sure you are all aware about what is SDG. 2030 is our target and we have lots to achieve and where do we stand? Uh, and what is actually universal health coverage? How, how is it uh, coined and what is what are all the things that um, curtail or pertain to universal health coverage and some good uh, assessments of where India stands in the global scenario and where should we head on from there. And then where does health technology assessment play a role in this entire bigger scenario? So as I mentioned, the SDG target 3.8 talks about universal health coverage, including financial risk protection. So universal health coverage is one of the targets that SDG 3.8 talks about. And what does it mean? That all people should have access to the needed health services. Could be preventive, promotive, curative, or rehabilitative and in such a manner that it should be quality service, health service, plus there should not be any financial hardships. So very, very important things when you coin this definition of universal health coverage. And this is something that has been thought for more than a century. It has evolved over time from various uh, reforms that have been happening globally from say, 1883, the first time Germany thought about it, and then how it moved from UK to the WHO and the Alma Mater Declaration in 78, and then the SDG 2015, when it actually was more made more global and people started talking about it. And recently, uh, there was a forum in 2017 in Tokyo also where they are reaffirming that universal health coverage is very, very important. Now, when we look at our own constitution, we think health is our right, but it is not very explicitly mentioned in our constitution. However, there are some directive principles of state policy enshrined in part four of the constitution, which talk about the state's role or the government's role in ensuring that promote welfare of its people, protect health and strengthen, uh, uh, strengthen its uh, case from abuse, provide public assistance in case of sickness, disability, and many other things, including nutrition, etc. So in the larger domain, indirectly, they say that health is our right, but they don't explicitly mention it. And now we know that Government of India is signatory to many such conventions that are making it obligatory to make health as a right. So basically, there are three main dimensions that equal access to health services, quality health care and protecting from financial risk. And uh, what are the main prerequisites that health financing and health protection? What are the service norms? So basically, it is about insurance. How are people going to reduce the out of pocket expenditure so that they are protected from uh, catastrophic health expenditure? Human resources for health, because we need people to deliver the service. When you say access to service, there should be enough manpower. Community participation and citizen engagement. Health is a matter, so it's so important to engage communities to decide what is, what is that they want. So involve communities, access to medicine, vaccines, and technology, and management and institutional reforms. So uh, when you want to think about universal health coverage, what all comes to our mind? It is whom all to cater to, basically. What is the population that we want to cater to? To what extent we want to cater to? What are the type of services we want to cater to? And whether there is any sharing of costs. So there are multiple dimensions when you think of universal health coverage. And there are certain guiding principles. So very uh, nicely, WHO has enlisted these guiding principles. Equality, irrespective of gender, class, uh, geographical areas, your socioeconomic status. And comprehensive care is what they are talking. Go to as near to the people as possible with comprehensive set of services. 
non-exclusion, no discrimination, and financial protection along with quality. So what are the expected outcomes? That if, if we provide universal health coverage, it will not only ensure good health of the individual, but of families, of societies, and indi indirectly their productivity in terms of whatever they do to themselves, to families, to the nation as a whole. And then there are accountable and transparent health systems in place so that these services that are provided are of good quality. And of course, the burden of disease eventually would come down. Now, to achieve this universal health coverage, there are two main strategies. One, as I mentioned, is the primary health care approach, that you go as comprehensive services, as close to people as possible. And there are three interrelated synergistic components within that. So not only these services, there should be also multi-sectoral policies that work well within these different domains, engage and empower individuals, families, and communities to make uh, or voice out what they want. So one thing that we have observed, uh, even in the primary health uh, facility, you will see that there is a committee where there are representatives from the community and they should have a say what their community needs. Nobody questions why this is not available, why the quality of service is so poor. There is no question and it is just accepted that whatever is provided is, is what we are supposed to get. So this component is so weak in our system, I think there has to be a lot of more questioning as accountability to increase the accountability of the health sector. Now, it should also focus on a life cycle approach. So we, we can look at diseases in isolation. And when you say health, it is very difficult to see it in silos. Now here they have explained with a very small example. Now there are not only health practices that are harmful, but there are a lot of socio-environmental determinants which are very, very uh, non-conducive to the health of the individual. And so when you see it from a more broader angle, it is very important to ad address those socio-environmental uh, factors as well. So if you just think of fetal malnutrition and focus only on that, suppose you don't address it uh, during that time, what will happen? There will be inadequate catch-up growth. There will be a long-term consequence because of that. So right from, you know, when the child is in utero, it is very important to think about its nutrition, its growth, so that there are many uh, other things that can be avoided. And so the chronic cycle of malnutrition can be prevented. So this holistic approach towards health is very, very important. And uh, universal health coverage is not only... Um, related to one SDG. If individuals are fit, you will see how best it will influence the other SDGs as well in terms of uh, it, their contribution to the other SDGs. For example, if you see equitable health outcomes and well-being in the global public security and societies, so the economic and the uh, job opportunities and creating all that will also, if you're focusing on nutrition, it is important to look at the agricultural part as well. So, you know, it is a very, very comprehensive approach and how SDGs, uh, are, one SDG will influence the other is very, very important. And the baseline for all this, uh, the foundation for all this is health system strengthening. So what has government tried to do to address this? We are all aware about the Ayushman Bharat. How many of you have heard this terminology? Ayushman Bharat, very good. Even private hospitals are empaneled to provide some of these uh, schemes that are uh, rolled out through the government. So they are focusing mainly on two main um, streams, that is uh, reach out more with comprehensive primary care to more and more people in rural areas. And so they are strengthening the primary health care system with what they call now as health and wellness centers. So now we know primary health care was mainly do, doing their jobs with reproductive maternal and child health or uh, looking after immunization or looking after epidemics. But now they are trying to also increase their domain of uh, reaching out to people for non-communicable diseases uh, like uh, diabetes, hypertension, cancer screening, stroke, etc. So the domain or the um, mandate of these uh, primary health care has increased with the same manpower, unfortunately, but sometimes we see that there are new centers coming up 
uh, at places where there uh, initially there were no access to services. So uh, they are trying to have lesser populations covered by these health centers so that the quality of care improves. But the other thing is about the PMJY scheme. So this is a largest government-run insurance scheme, uh, and it it is mainly to support families which are uh, uh, you know below the poverty line, where government is ensuring that each family would get about five lakh rupees for uh, uh, health-related expenditure per year, and this insurance scheme is really. Uh, a boon to such households for especially chronic illnesses or even very uh, expensive surgeries, for example. And they are totally funded by the government and it is cashless. But what is not taken care within the domain of PMJY is the out-of-pocket expenditure. That is still, a, what you call, uh, a limitation. And yes, we have to move with something and there are more goals to achieve, but yet, Within the domains of the PMJY, the out-of-pocket expenditure currently is not being included. Or the nutritional supplementation, there are many things that need to go hand in hand to improve the health. Not only medicine and hospitalization, but many other things that are not covered under this domain. So what is it that uh, the health and wellness centers are covering? Uh, the mainly the unmet needs for the non-communicable diseases, as I mentioned with a good referral linkages to the secondary and tertiary hospitals. So the targets, they have set in certain targets to complete. So by December 2022, we are hoping to see at least uh, 40,000 more health and wellness centers being established across the country. And this is the graph which is showing how this has progressed over time and it is really commendable. And uh, you, can, you can see that these uh, uh, health and wellness centers are really performing very nicely. And some of the aspects that were not talked about early, it is about screening, diagnosing early. So prevention is something that they are focusing a lot on. So government is really spending a lot on these, uh, uh, on these schemes and the latest national health account estimates for India 2018-19, you can read these reports and which say <coughs> how the finances for different aspects by the government, central government, state government or other stakeholders, how they have uh, you know, contributed to running these schemes. And uh, even the private sector is also being enrolled public-private partnership. And so this is really working in hand in hand, uh, which is really benefiting the communities. So one would want to know, okay, all this is fine, whether we could really measure these uh, indicate by some indicators. Yes, so as I mentioned, the SDG 3.8.1 talks about indicators for coverage and 8.2 about financial protection. So what they have uh, um, listed out are the four main categories. So within 3.8, Point uh, one, um, there are these four categories, reproductive, maternal, newborn, and child health is one broad category under which they have various subcategories. Infectious disease is one, non-communicable disease, and service capacity and access is another major uh, category under which uh, these uh, uh, coverage indicators are measured. So this is a report from WHO, and this is where we stand in terms of the global scenario. So in terms of the coverage index, you can see India is somewhere around 60 to 80th rank, if you see among all countries. And I think it is pretty good compared to most other uh, parts of other regions. But yes, we have a long way to achieve. When it comes to um, a specific uh, indicator on infectious disease, again, I think we are faring uh, almost similar. Uh, but non-communicable disease is also, yes, same, almost similar on the global map, and maternal and child health as well. So more or less, it is same. In terms of uh, capacity and access, this is where we have yet to fare better, because we are really uh, falling back uh, and so our health system needs to be more strengthened to ensure that the capacity or the quality of care and access to service needs to 
better improve than what we are as of today. And if we see where we stand in terms of our neighboring Southeast Asian countries, again, it is a little sad scenario because uh, we see that countries like um, Nepal, Ma Myanmar are doing little better than what India is doing. Sri Lanka, of course, uh, we know has a robust health system, so they are faring better. So uh, I think in, in the global map, we, we stand little uh, way behind and we have a long way to achieve. Uh, there are many different reasons why it is so difficult in a diverse country like ours where health is a state subject. It is not uh, centrally driven, everything is not very centrally driven and so to have homogeneity across geographies, across different health systems is very, uh, really very challenging. Uh, and here again, uh, these are the, in numerical terms, the indicators. So uh, you can see how, what progress India has made from say 2000 until 19, and this report talks of. And I think it is a very steady, good progress that we have made, except for some, uh, some issues related to service capacity and access. So you may all uh, ponder upon this as students. Uh, Maharashtra is really struggling to get doctors working at PHCs. And as uh, medicos, when you all come out of your medical colleges, everybody has a dream that what you want to achieve. And most of you will be very happy working with the uh, urban, in urban sector. And unless we as students are groomed and dedicated to perform some part of our duties, even in rural sector, we will never see the light of this, uh, what we want to achieve. Government tries to make compulsory bonds and this and that, and still there are so many loopholes how you find your way out. Uh, so if we take responsibility as a nation, I don't think this will be so challenging because I don't think money is an issue. It's a matter of your perspective and what we want to give back to the nation. And so um, uh, recently you have seen all the, um, what do you call, news uh, where those who were serving the public sector had some reservations in their post-graduation seats. And there was you and cry about it. I think it was, uh, it was doing justice to them. And unless you encourage or give them some such, uh, you know, in incentives, how will people want to do something? And secondly, we cannot look at health in isolation. If, if, if the rural uh, areas are as equal in terms of opportunities for education, for other uh, living conditions, I'm sure even today private doctors would be very happy to go and work in rural areas. So it is a social larger dimension that needs to be improved and not just focus on the primary health care building or, you know, <laughs> just limited to that. There needs, needs to be water, electricity, good roads, good education, good connectivity, good internet services, for example, an ATM <laughs> or whatever you think. So it's a very, very uh, broader dimension that one needs to. And so we are really faring bad on that account. And I think there needs to be some out of box thinking when we want to achieve that. Now, uh, there was another report which looked at uh, household expenditure on health greater than 10% of the household budget. And you see uh, where India stands, it is very high, uh, relatively very high. So out of the total health budget, uh, household budget, how much is being spent uh, from out of their pocket for health related expenditure and that is out of pocket expenditure is still very high. Um, as a uh, SDG3 uh, overall target, we see that the India stands at a place where there are many challenges, significant challenges still remain, is what WHO is uh, trying to conclude. And uh, the highest quintile, wealth quintiles are the ones who have the most access to health facilities and that is very obvious, we are all witness to it. Uh, so there was one um, analysis done for reproductive, maternal and child health and uh, all the indicators for the poorest quantiles were very, very low. Um, so as per Global Health Expenditure Database uh, of 2017, uh, I'm just looking at what it is of today. Uh, we stand 66th rank among 189 countries and so our out-of-pocket expenditure still in terms of per capita is really still very high. 
in 2019, uh, India's health system ranked in the bottom third decile of 204 countries. So our coverage index is still very low, 47 out of 100, in contrast to say UK, etc., and many other countries. And less than 1% of our GDP is spent by the state on health. I'll come to some latest um, news that was in paper. Do you read all this? in newspaper because health economics is something not of interest to clinicians. I think it is time that we talk in terms of um, money when it comes to health as well. Um, and the latest NHSRC report says that 50% of out-of-pocket expenditure is still uh, what India has in terms of the Niti Aayog report in 2021. Now there is one uh, very nice report uh, by the National Health Account Estimate for 1819. And they have tried to showcase how with all these schemes, the Ayushaban Bharat scheme, how is India doing better than what it was. So there is a positive trend in growth of government expenditure, as is seen here, from 1.15% to 1.28%. And a government expenditure per GDP, uh, per, as percent of GDP has also increased over time. Uh, uh, government health expenditure as a percentage of total health expenditure is also showing a market increase, almost 20% increase. Uh, and same is true in terms of its share in current health expenditure. Uh, even per capita expenditure has increased, expenditure on primary health care has increased and uh, out-of-pocket expenditure has decreased. So there is some uh, positive trend that we are already seeing, which is very supportive of what government is doing. Uh, and uh, yeah, these are several other figures which are showing that there is uh, an improvement and the goal at which, for which all this is being done is uh, being slowly achieved. But if you see, there were some newspaper reports recently and they have critically appraised this document and uh, they are trying to, uh, so one, one newspaper uh, cutting that I saw was uh, if health expenditure uh, is necessary but spending alone is not sufficient. So it, it was like, you know, at some time when there were institutional deliveries was made mandatory. And yet we still saw a lot of maternal mortality and neonatal mortality. So why was that? Because there was no quality care. So coming to a hospital did not 100% ensure that the mother and the child is going to walk out safe. So it's not important only spending, but a correct spending in terms of quality is very, very essential. And what they have done is they have looked at what is the health expenditure. So some states like Kerala and Maharashtra are spending a lot on health but it is mainly out of pocket. The government is not spending as much. But then there are states like Bihar, Jharkhand, uh, and others who are spending from uh, much more in terms of government's expenditure and not so much in terms of out of pocket expenditure and comparatively their indicators we know are not so very good. And even Maharashtra is spending less in terms of GDP uh, so uh, there were a lot of remarks on this. Now there was one critical appraisal which said that, uh, okay, out-of-pocket expenditure has reduced, government spending has increased. But then they looked at total admissions in the hospital, total surgery or whatever procedures. Everything had fallen down over time. And they started wondering whether it is good to just, you know, manually correlate these two and say that this is... Uh, because directly because of these schemes or there is much more to look at the data and analyze the intricacies and uh, really look at it with a better lens and see what is really happening, just not look at the outcomes. So, you know, all these uh, throws light that more uh, data analysis of details of why this is happening and whether it is reflecting the true story is very important so that we know what are the gaps and then address them. Yeah, so my friend uh, Dr. Bhavani had just uh, published this paper. Uh, is state-wise healthcare budget allocation consistent with the disease burden in the country? So where are we really investing? Now NCDs, as we know, is the most uh, talked about, or the, it is increasing in Im immense proportions, the non-communicable diseases. But if you see in terms of the government's uh, uh, 
Dr. Bhavani, you can address this later, but in terms of government spending, is it, are we really looking at what burden of disease is there in the community or in your particular state and investing resources accordingly, or it is just like a blanket thing? So we need to really assess and do some critical thinking where we want to in invest our limited resources on. Yeah, so this is one Australian um, uh, strategy that they worked out, um, how to, you know, think about where to invest. So in, you should have these basics, equity, access, diversity, supportive environments, and the cost should come the last. So all the, uh, in terms of priority populations that you need to provide services, the prevalence of disease in their community, and whatever are the interventions for prevention, not only curative, but even preventive. So I think it is very important to have a bottom-up approach than, you know, just think in a blanket format, what is essential to be uh, actually roped into the service fact, uh, sector. Now there are very, uh, very many factors you can just uh, sit back and assess and very, very logically you may come to some conclusions that what are the factors, why, why this is happening. So we know that infrastructure is a problem, manpower is a problem, there are problems with resources, um, then socioeconomic factors and also the rural versus the urban divide and gender norms. So there are many, many things to address, not only in terms of money, but also the other dimensions of health that needs to be addressed. So what is being uh, talked about for universal health uh, coverage uh, is uh, we need to have a multi-sectoral approach, uh, establishment of a public health commission. I think this is what Bhavani uh, has recommended uh, in terms of coordinating with various uh, ministries, not only, so if it is women and child health, it is not only health and family welfare, there are other social ministries also that need to coordinate the nutrition uh, is part of it. So there has to be a multi-sectoral, uh, you know, uh, conversions. And uh, at least 5% of the GDP should be earmarked for a public uh, health sector and uh, now this only by increasing uh, the quality as well as the cost is what you will be able to achieve. Uh, and uh, of course, accountability is very important. There are a lot of, uh, you know, uh, suggestions that out-of-pocket expenditure should also be part of this PMJY scheme, uh, especially when there it comes to screening for NCDs and uh, that will reduce the out-of-pocket expenditure. The uh, drugs used should also be rationalized. You know, there is a lot of antimicrobial resistance, so uh, many other things, overuse of medicine should be also controlled. So, uh, uh, yeah, so many other things, m many other dimensions also need to be thought in. Now, this is, uh, this day is celebrated uh, December 22nd as Universal Health Coverage, uh, sorry, 12th December, uh, Universal Health Coverage Day. I don't think we ever celebrate this. I have, when I made this presentation, I happen to know that this is some day that is worth celebrating and so we all should uh, actually bring focus uh, that a healthy future for all is what uh, we are aiming at and so we need to sensitize um, not only the community, but also the stakeholders who have to think in the di this direction. So this is a nice cartoon I thought I should make, which is encompassing all the uh, dimensions that I talked until now. And uh, this is made by one of our <laughs> research team uh, uh, fellow. Uh, so if, if you talk of universal health coverage, it is like an umbrella protecting the average common man, irrespective of gender, creed, socioeconomic status, class, whatever, who are citizens of India. And the services that universal health coverage intends to provide should be affordable, accountable, appropriate, accessible, and of good quality. And they should have these various dimensions of promotive, preventive, curative, rehabilitative, and palliative. So we know that there are already many gaps. We don't have, so we are so much more for curative than preventive. Don't you agree that so much, even our training is so much more on curative and not on preventive. So I think there has to be some change in the way uh, at every step uh, the thought process goes. 
and uh, incentives should also be provided uh, to the healthcare or the industry uh, to create more innovative produ products so that you know the access is made easy because of very expensive products uh, we don't find governments easily accepting uh, these new technologies or new medicines or whatever to be made available in the public health sector so uh, make in India is, uh, is the theme. So there is a lot of encouragement for research, for uh, uh, you know, bringing new products which are made in India. And uh, that will only be one big major step in addressing this universal health coverage. And of course, the uh, GDP that is uh, the budget that is allocated has to increase. We have been struggling to get it above 1%. <laughs> and we know, every time we hear about it, uh, we know India invests a lot on defense, which is essential, but what happens to health? Now, we are the youngest nation. We have the most young adolescents and young population in our country. If we don't look after their health, what happens? And similarly, we have to also address the elderly. Uh, needs of the elderly so it's it's a very difficult job for a policy maker to assess where to invest that limited resource that he gets and within all this the health technology assessment comes to their um, you know aid so it is very very challenging to balance the ever increasing demand for different newer newer diseases or the chronic diseases and the limited resources that one has. So this balancing act uh, is very uh, difficult and so health technology assessment is one tool that will aid uh, in the larger uh, gamut to make decisions, although it is not the only one. So, um, so this is one cartoon where you know um, we are talking about economic costs and health related quality of life. So ultimately we are interested in quality of life. We, we are not interested only to live longer, but also we should have a good healthy quality. So that is what we are aiming at. And so health technology assessment is a systematic evaluation of properties, effects, and impacts uh, of technologies uh, or health interventions. It facilitates efficient utilization of limited funds that are available, which are based on cost effectiveness. So we are uh, always taught in clinical practice to focus more on clinical effectiveness. So what is the, uh, what percent uh, surety you have that you will be cured of this disease by taking these medicines for whatever regime that we told. So uh, in terms of clinical effectiveness, we are very, very pro, but we don't think of cost effectiveness as one important parameter as well. So uh, HT also assesses safety, equity, and ethical issues, and aids in informed decision making. So one, one major uh, um, indicator that we use to say cost effectiveness, it is ICER or ICER. CER, that is incremental cost effectiveness ratio or incremental cost utility ratio. So it is nothing but difference in cost by difference in outcomes. And outcomes we measure mainly for our uh, norms in India, what, what has been set by the Health Technology Assessment Board is uh, quality uh, adjusted life years. So between two interventions, if you have to make a decision, what is the difference in cost by difference in the health outcomes in terms of quality adjusted life years? Or it could be other parameters when we use cost effectiveness ratio, could be whatever is the disease and its related outcomes in terms of say, if it is any reproductive health intervention, we could say pr pregnancies averted or you know difference in number of childbirths or whatever is the intervention that we are looking at. So health technologies could be anything. They could be medicines, they could be devices, they could be diagnostics, they could be programs as well. And uh, so when you say technology, it is not limited to some you know, drug or device alone. It could be assessment of public health programs for that matter, an approach through which you, you are addressing a particular health issue in the community. So they could be of variety of uh, this uh, uh, means, or sometimes uh, we are also talking about uh, the PMJY health benefit packages. So there are several diseases that are outlined for health benefit packages. Suppose 
uh, a lady uh, is undergoing a cesarean section and she is uh, uh, you know qualifying to avail of the pmjy scheme then uh, this is one package which is already part of the pmjy there are n number of uh, packages that are listed out and so that is one thing that she can avail of uh, in terms of cashless service so what happens uh, when hta is done basically there is a technology and then you get a regulatory approval to get it into the system and then you have to make a decision whether it, it has to be brought into the program or just it has to be you know made in pub private sector or whether you want to really bring it into the government program so uh, what is the standard of care currently so suppose there are two drugs for these so what is the standard of uh, care currently you compare the new technology with that existing standard of care and then rope in this health technology to make uh, logical conclusions whether bringing this into the program is of any benefit so the perspective is little different when it when it comes to hta it is more of cost effectiveness including the clinical effectiveness of course but uh, when it, when the regulatory authority thinks it is mainly from safety uh, and efficacy perspective so uh, the role of hta is uh, to prioritize uh, from the technologies and uh, also talking about the cost the qualities efficient budget allocation and of course this will further aid in uh, working out the standard treatment workflows that is how uh, they see it so we have uh, several uh, resource hubs that have been capacitated from dhr to undertake health technology assessment studies and there is a secretariat which is based in delhi uh, at dhr and a uh, lot of studies are uh, you know uh, conducted through these resource hub as per their mandate the questions that are posed to these health technology assessment is from the user departments i as a scientist rarely can think that this is a question of importance it has to be coming from a user department who thinks okay this is a question and i want to take it ahead so whether it, this particular intervention is cost effective or not uh, these this system is already in place in uk the nice uh, already makes use of this uh, before it launches into the uh, program so safety engineered syringes so government of punjab was very interested they have lot of injection drug users so they wanted to know which uh, syringe is the best one to use so uh, this has been undertaken by the pgi chandigarh group and uh, they demonstrated that safety engineered syringes was quite cost effective i will not go into details it is a modeling exercise where you mimic real life scenario and uh, take Uh, a particular uh, cohort of population and see what happens uh, over time and so this has been implemented by state like punjab even andhra pradesh has shown interest to bring these safety engineered syringe into their program so there are other projects which uh, have been undertaken like uh, there was a portable ecg device uh, which was like made in india and so they wanted to see whether it is cost effective we worked on a new injective uh, implant contraceptive so uh, whether bringing a new implant contraceptive to the basket of choice of existing contraceptives in the government program whether it is cost effective so this is levonorgestrel uh, uh, etonorgestrel implant uh, marketed in india as implanon nxg so we demonstrated that it is cost effective and there are several diagnostic devices like trunat trunat for tuberculosis and uh, yeah pulse oximeter uh, to prevent childhood pneumonia um, and related mortality and morbidity so these are some studies that have been undertaken including tranexamic acid in management of postpartum hemorrhage is one study that we took up and uh, we have recommended its uh, position in the labor room tray that is there as an emergency tray it should reflect there or in the dakshata checklist guidelines for pph then there are other uh, uh, studies being undertaken on a lot of cancer drugs uh, and a national cancer database and cost and quality of life is also uh, in process uh, right so uh, there are several packages that have been modified 
you know, earlier only group of experts sat and made these packages. Now by doing actual costing exercises, they are able to say this is and modify them because they are, uh, they are the actual costs that have been estimated. So recently, very recently, we helped government to make a decision on the point of care test for screening sickle cell anemia. And so there were very var various point of care tests and they wanted to know uh, and they were all very expensive, say about 300 per test. And so by doing uh, threshold analysis, we told government that you can negotiate the cost to less than rupees 100 for it to be made cost effective and they could manage doing it and getting it into the program. So we are uh, waiting for the bill and uh, DHR is working very hard to get this bill rolling. And uh, yeah, so you'll see a lot of these manuals. I would like to conclude here. Thank you very much. And I acknowledge all the support from DHR and my team. Thank you.